This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The History of Mary Prince by Mary Prince. Preface by our sufferings since ye brought us to the man-degrading mart all sustained by patience taught us only by a broken heart deem our nation brutes no longer till some reason ye shall find worthier of regard and stronger than the colour of our kind cooper the idea of writing mary prince's history was first suggested by herself she wished it to be done she said that good people in england might hear from a slave what a slave had felt and suffered and a letter of her late master's which will be found in the supplement induced me to accede to her wish without farther delay the more immediate object of the publication will afterwards appear the narrative was taken down from mary's own lips by a lady who happened to be at the time residing in my family as a visitor it was written out fully with all the narrator's repetitions and prolixities and afterwards pruned into its present shape retaining as far as was practicable mary's exact expressions and peculiar phraseology no fact of importance has been omitted and not a single circumstance or sentiment has been added it is essentially her own without any material alteration farther than was requisite to exclude redundancies and gross grammatical errors so as to render it clearly intelligible after it had been thus written out i went over the whole carefully examining her on every fact and circumstance detailed and in all that relates to her residence in antigua i had the advantage of being assisted in this scrutiny by mr joseph phillips who was a resident in that colony during the same period and had known her there the names of all the persons mentioned by the narrator have been printed in full except those of captain i and his wife and that of mr d to whom conduct of peculiar atrocity is ascribed these three individuals are now gone to answer at a far more awful tribunal than that of public opinion for the deeds of which their former bondwoman accuses them and to hold them up more openly to human reprobation could no longer affect themselves while it might deeply lacerate the feelings of their surviving and perhaps innocent relatives without any commensurate public advantage without detaining the reader with remarks on other points which will be adverted to more conveniently in the supplement i shall here merely notice farther that the anti-slavery society have no concern whatever with this publication nor are they in any degree responsible for the statements it contains i have published the tract not as their secretary but in my private capacity and any profits that may arise from the sale will be exclusively appropriated to the benefit of mary prince herself thomas pringle seven soliteris claremont square january twenty fifth eighteen hundred and thirty one p s since writing the above I have been furnished by my friend, Mr. George Stephen, with the interesting narrative of Asa Asa, a captured African, now under his protection, and have printed it as a suitable appendix to this little history. T.P. The History of Mary Prince, Part 1 I was born at Brackish Pond, in Bermuda, on a farm belonging to Mr. Charles Miners, my mother was a household slave, and my father, whose name was Prince, was a sawyer belonging to Mr. Trimmingham, a shipbuilder at Crow Lane. When I was an infant, old Mr. Miners died, and there was a division of the slaves and other property among the family. I was bought along with my mother by old Captain Darrell, and given to his grandchild, little Miss Betsy Williams. Captain Williams, Mr. Darrell's son-in-law, was master of a vessel which traded to several places in America and the West Indies, and he was seldom at home long together. Mrs. Williams was a kind-hearted good woman, and she treated all her slaves well. She had only one daughter, Miss Betsy, for whom I was purchased, and who was about my own age. I was made quite a pet of by Miss Betsy, and loved her very much. 
she used to lead me about by the hand and call me her little nigger this was the happiest period of my life for i was too young to understand rightly my condition as a slave and too thoughtless and full of spirits to look forward to the days of toil and sorrow my mother was a household slave in the same family i was under her own care and my little brothers and sisters were my playfellows and companions my mother had several fine children after she came to mrs williams three girls and two boys the tasks given out to us children were light and we used to play together with miss betsy with as much freedom almost as if she had been our sister my master however was a very harsh selfish man and we always dreaded his return from sea his wife was herself much afraid of him and during his stay at home seldom dared to show her usual kindness to the slaves he often left her in the most distressed circumstances to reside in other female society at some place in the west indies of which i have forgot the name my poor mistress bore his ill-treatment with great patience and all her slaves loved and pitied her i was truly attached to her and next to my own mother loved her better than any creature in the world my obedience to her commands was cheerfully given it sprung solely from the affection i felt for her and not from fear of the power which the white people's law had given her over me i had scarcely reached my twelfth year when my mistress became too poor to keep so many of us at home and she hired me out to mrs pruden a lady who lived about five miles off in the adjoining parish in a large house near the sea i cried bitterly at parting with my dear mistress and miss betsy and when i kissed my mother and brothers and sisters i thought my young heart would break it pained me so but there was no help i was forced to go good mrs williams comforted me by saying that i should still be near the home i was about to quit and might come over and see her and my kindred whenever i could obtain leave of absence from mrs pruden a few hours after this i was taken to a strange house and found myself among strange people this separation seemed a sore trial to me then but oh twas light light to the trials i have since endured twas nothing nothing to be mentioned with them but i was a child then and it was according to my strength i knew that mrs williams could no longer maintain me that she was fain to part with me for my food and clothing and i tried to submit myself to the change my new mistress was a passionate woman but yet she did not treat me very unkindly i do not remember her striking me but once and that was for going to see mrs williams when i heard she was sick and staying longer than she had given me leave to do all my employment at this time was nursing a sweet baby little master daniel and i grew so fond of my nursling that it was my greatest delight to walk out with him by the seashore accompanied by his brother and sister miss fanny and master james dear miss fanny she was a sweet kind young lady and so fond of me that she wished me to learn all that she knew herself and her method of teaching me was as follows directly she had said her lessons to her grandmamma she used to come running to me and make me repeat them one by one after her and in a few months i was able not only to say my letters but to spell many small words but this happy state was not to last long those days were too pleasant to last my heart always softens when i think of them at this time mrs williams died i was told suddenly of her death and my grief was so great that forgetting i had the baby in my arms i ran away directly to my poor mistress's house but reached it only in time to see the corpse carried out oh that was a day of sorrow a heavy day all the slaves cried my mother cried and lamented her sore and i foolish creature vainly entreated them to bring my dear mistress back to life i knew nothing rightly about death then and it seemed a hard thing to bear when i thought about my mistress i felt as if the world was all gone wrong and for many days and weeks i could think of nothing else 
i returned to mrs pruden's but my sorrow was too great to be comforted for my own dear mistress was always in my mind whether in the house or abroad my thoughts were always talking to me about her i stayed at mrs pruden's about three months after this i was then sent back to mr williams to be sold oh that was a sad sad time i recollect the day well mrs pruden came to me and said mary you will have to go home directly your master is going to be married and he means to sell you and two of your sisters to raise money for the wedding hearing this i burst out a-crying though i was then far from being sensible of the full weight of my misfortune or of the misery that waited for me besides i did not like to leave mrs pruden and the dear baby who had grown very fond of me for some time i could scarcely believe that mrs pruden was in earnest till i received orders for my immediate return dear miss fanny how she cried at parting with me whilst i kissed and hugged the baby thinking i should never see him again i left mrs pruden's and walked home with a heart full of sorrow the idea of being sold away from my mother and miss betsy was so frightful that i dared not trust myself to think about it we had been bought of mr minor's as i have mentioned by miss betsy's grandfather and given to her so that we were by right her property and i never thought we should be separated or sold away from her when i reached the house i went in directly to miss betsy i found her in great distress and she cried out as soon as she saw me oh mary my father is going to sell you all to raise money to marry that wicked woman you are my slaves and he has no right to sell you but it is all to please her she then told me that my mother was living with her father's sister at a house close by and i went there to see her it was a sorrowful meeting and we lamented with a great and sore crying our unfortunate situation here comes one of my poor pickaninnies she said the moment i came in one of the poor slave brood who are to be sold to-morrow oh dear i cannot bear to think of that day it is too much it recalls the great grief that filled my heart and the woeful thoughts that passed to and fro through my mind whilst listening to the pitiful words of my poor mother weeping for the loss of her children i wish i could find words to tell you all i then felt and suffered the great god above alone knows the thoughts of the poor slave's heart and the bitter pains which follow such separations as these all that we love taken away from us oh it is sad sad and sore to be borne i got no sleep that night for thinking of the morrow and dear miss betsy was scarcely less distressed she could not bear to part with her old playmates and she cried sore and would not be pacified the black morning at length came it came too soon for my poor mother and us whilst she was putting on us the new osnaburgs in which we were to be sold she said in a sorrowful voice i shall never forget it see i am shrouding my poor children what a task for a mother she then called miss betsy to take leave of us i am going to carry my little chickens to market these were her very words take your last look of them maybe you will see them no more oh my poor slaves my own slaves said dear miss betsy you belong to me and it grieves my heart to part with you miss betsy kissed us all and when she left us my mother called the rest of the slaves to bid us good-bye one of them a woman named moll came with her infant in her arms ay said my mother seeing her turn away and look at her child with the tears in her eyes your turn will come next the slaves could say nothing to comfort us they could only weep and lament with us when i left my dear little brothers and the house in which i had been brought up i thought my heart would burst our mother weeping as she went called me away with the children hannah and dinah and we took the road that led to hambletown 
which we reached about four o'clock in the afternoon we followed my mother to the market-place where she placed us in a row against a large house with our backs to the wall and our arms folded across our breasts i as the eldest stood first hannah next to me then dinah and our mother stood beside crying over us my heart throbbed with grief and terror so violently that i pressed my hands quite tightly across my breast but i could not keep it still and it continued to leap as though it would burst out of my body but who cared for that did one of the many bystanders who were looking at us so carelessly think of the pain that wrung the hearts of the negro woman and her young ones no no they were not all bad i dare say but slavery hardens white people's hearts towards the blacks and many of them were not slow to make their remarks upon us aloud without regard to our grief though their light words fell like cayenne on the fresh wounds of our hearts oh those white people have small hearts who can only feel for themselves at length the vendue master who was to offer us for sale like sheep or cattle arrived and asked my mother which was the eldest she said nothing but pointed to me he took me by the hand and led me out into the middle of the street and turning me slowly round exposed me to the view of those who attended the vendue i was soon surrounded by strange men who examined and handled me in the same manner that a butcher would a calf or a lamb he was about to purchase and who talked about my shape and size in like words as if i could no more understand their meaning than the dumb beasts i was then put up to sale the bidding commenced at a few pounds and gradually rose to fifty-seven when i was knocked down to the highest bidder and the people who stood by said that i had fetched a great sum for so young a slave i then saw my sisters led forth and sold to different owners so that we had not the sad satisfaction of being partners in bondage when the sale was over my mother hugged and kissed us and mourned over us begging of us to keep up a good heart and do our duty to our new masters it was a sad parting one went one way one another and our poor mammy went home with nothing my new master was a captain i who lived at spanish point after parting with my mother and sisters i followed him to his store and he gave me into the charge of his son a lad about my own age master benjy who took me to my new home i did not know where i was going or what my new master would do with me my heart was quite broken with grief and my thoughts went back continually to those from whom i had been so suddenly parted oh my mother my mother i kept saying to myself oh my mammy and my sisters and my brothers shall i never see you again oh the trials the trials they make the salt water come into my eyes when i think of the days in which i was afflicted the times that are gone when i mourned and grieved with a young heart for those whom i loved it was night when i reached my new home the house was large and built at the bottom of a very high hill but i could not see much of it that night i saw too much of it afterwards the stones and the timber were the best things in it they were not so hard as the hearts of the owners before i entered the house two slave women hired from another owner who were at work in the yard spoke to me and asked who i belonged to i replied i am come to live here poor child poor child they both said you must keep a good heart if you are to live here when i went in i stood up crying in a corner mrs i came and took off my hat a little black silk hat miss pruden made for me and said in a rough voice you are not come here to stand up in corners and cry you are come here to work she then put a child into my arms and tired as i was i was forced instantly to take up my old occupation of a nurse i could not bear to look at my mistress her countenance was so stern 
she was a stout tall woman with a very dark complexion and her brows were always drawn together into a frown i thought of the words of the two slave women when i saw mrs i and heard the harsh sound of her voice the person i took the most notice of that night was a french black called hetty whom my master took in privateering from another vessel and made his slave she was the most active woman i ever saw and she was tasked to her utmost a few minutes after my arrival she came in from milking the cows and put the sweet potatoes on for supper she then fetched home the sheep and penned them in the fold drove home the cattle and staked them about the pond side fed and rubbed down my master's horse and gave the hog and the fed cow their suppers prepared the beds and undressed the children and laid them to sleep i liked to look at her and watch all her doings for hers was the only friendly face i had as yet seen and i felt glad that she was there she gave me my supper of potatoes and milk and a blanket to sleep upon which she spread for me in the passage before the door of mrs i's chamber i got a sad fright that night i was just going to sleep when i heard a noise in my mistress's room and she presently called out to inquire if some work was finished that she had ordered hetty to do no ma'am not yet was hetty's answer from below on hearing this my master started up from his bed and just as he was in his shirt ran downstairs with a long cowskin in his hand i heard immediately after the cracking of the thong and the house rang to the shrieks of poor hetty who kept crying out oh massa massa me dead massa have mercy upon me don't kill me outright this was a sad beginning for me i sat up upon my blanket trembling with terror like a frightened hound and thinking that my turn would come next at length the house became still and i forgot for a little while all my sorrows by falling fast asleep the next morning my mistress set about instructing me in my tasks she taught me to do all sorts of household work to wash and bake pick cotton and wool and wash floors and cook and she taught me how can i ever forget it more things than these she caused me to know the exact difference between the smart of the rope the cart whip and the cowskin when applied to my naked body by her own cruel hand and there was scarcely any punishment more dreadful than the blows i received on my face and head from her hard heavy fist she was a fearful woman and a savage mistress to her slaves part two there were two little slave boys in the house on whom she vented her bad temper in a special manner one of these children was a mulatto called cyrus who had been bought while an infant in his mother's arms the other jack was an african from the coast of guinea whom a sailor had given or sold to my master seldom a day passed without these boys receiving the most severe treatment and often for no fault at all both my master and mistress seemed to think that they had a right to ill-use them at their pleasure and very often accompanied their commands with blows whether the children were behaving well or ill i have seen their flesh ragged and raw with licks lick lick they were never secure one moment from a blow and their lives were passed in continual fear my mistress was not contented with using the whip but often pinched their cheeks and arms in the most cruel manner my pity for these poor boys was soon transferred to myself for i was licked and flogged and pinched by her pitiless fingers in the neck and arms exactly as they were to strip me naked to hang me up by the wrists and lay my flesh open with the cowskin was an ordinary punishment for even a slight offence my mistress often robbed me too of the hours that belonged to sleep she used to sit up very late frequently even until morning and i had then to stand at a bench and wash during the greater part of the night or pick wool and cotton and often i have dropped down overcome by sleep and fatigue till roused from a state of stupor by the whip and forced to start up to my tasks poor hetty my fellow-slave 
was very kind to me and i used to call her my aunt but she led a most miserable life and her death was hastened at least the slaves all believed and said so by the dreadful chastisement she received from my master during her pregnancy it happened as follows one of the cows had dragged the rope away from the stake to which hetty had fastened it and got loose my master flew into a terrible passion and ordered the poor creature to be stripped quite naked notwithstanding her pregnancy and to be tied up to a tree in the yard he then flogged her as hard as he could lick both with the whip and cowskin till she was all over streaming with blood he rested and then beat her again and again her shrieks were terrible the consequence was that poor hetty was brought to bed before her time and was delivered after severe labour of a dead child she appeared to recover after her confinement so far that she was repeatedly flogged by both master and mistress afterwards but her former strength never returned to her ere long her body and limbs swelled to a great size and she lay on a mat in the kitchen till the water burst out of her body and she died all the slaves said that death was a good thing for poor hetty but i cried very much for her death the manner of it filled me with horror i could not bear to think about it yet it was always present to my mind for many a day after hetty died all her labours fell upon me in addition to my own i had now to milk eleven cows every morning before sunrise sitting among the damp weeds to take care of the cattle as well as the children and to do the work of the house there was no end to my toils no end to my blows i lay down at night and rose up in the morning in fear and sorrow and often wished that like poor hetty i could escape from this cruel bondage and be at rest in the grave but the hand of that god whom then i knew not was stretched over me and i was mercifully preserved for better things it was then however my heavy lot to weep 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 and that for years to pass from one misery to another and from one cruel master to a worse but i must go on with the thread of my story one day a heavy squall of wind and rain came on suddenly and my mistress sent me round the corner of the house to empty a large earthen jar the jar was already cracked with an old deep crack that divided it in the middle and in turning it upside down to empty it it parted in my hand i could not help the accident but i was dreadfully frightened looking forward to a severe punishment i ran crying to my mistress oh mistress the jar has come in too you have broken it have you she replied come directly here to me i came trembling she stripped and flogged me long and severely with the cowskin as long as she had strength to use the lash for she did not give over till she was quite tired when my master came home at night she told him of my fault and oh frightful how he fell a swearing after abusing me with every ill name he could think of too too bad to speak in england and giving me several heavy blows with his hand he said i shall come home to-morrow morning at twelve on purpose to give you a round hundred he kept his word oh sad for me i cannot easily forget it he tied me up upon a ladder and gave me a hundred lashes with his own hand and master benjy stood by to count them for him when he had licked me for some time he sat down to take breath then after resting he beat me again and again until he was quite wearied and so hot for the weather was very sultry that he sank back in his chair almost like to faint while my mistress went to bring him drink there was a dreadful earthquake part of the roof fell down and everything in the house went clatter 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 oh i thought the end of all things near at hand and i was so sore with the flogging that i scarcely cared whether i lived or died the earth was groaning and shaking everything tumbling about and my mistress and the slaves were shrieking and crying out the earthquake the earthquake it was an awful day for us all during the confusion i crawled away on my hands and knees 
and laid myself down under the steps of the piazza in front of the house i was in a dreadful state my body all blood and bruises and i could not help moaning piteously the other slaves when they saw me shook their heads and said poor child poor child i lay there till the morning careless of what might happen for life was very weak in me and i wished more than ever to die but when we are very young death always seems a great way off and it would not come that night to me the next morning i was forced by my master to rise and go about my usual work though my body and limbs were so stiff and sore that i could not move without the greatest pain nevertheless even after all this severe punishment i never heard the last of that jar my mistress was always throwing it in my face some little time after this one of the cows got loose from the stake and ate one of the sweet potato slips i was milking when my master found it out he came to me and without any more ado stooped down and taking off his heavy boot he struck me such a severe blow in the small of my back that i shrieked with agony and thought i was killed and i feel the weakness in that part to this day the cow was frightened at his violence and kicked down the pail and spilt the milk all about my master knew that this accident was his own fault but he was so enraged that he seemed glad of an excuse to go on with his ill usage i cannot remember how many licks he gave me then but he beat me till i was unable to stand until he himself was weary after this i ran away and went to my mother who was living with mr richard darrell my poor mother was both grieved and glad to see me grieved because i had been so ill-used and glad because she had not seen me for a long long while she dared not receive me into the house but she hid me up in a hole in the rocks near and brought me food at night after everybody was asleep my father who lived at crow lane over the salt-water channel at last heard of my being hid up in the cavern and he came and took me back to my master oh i was loath loath to go but as there was no remedy i was obliged to submit when we got home my poor father said to captain i sir i am sorry that my child should be forced to run away from her owner but the treatment she has received is enough to break her heart the sight of her wounds has nearly broke mine i entreat you for the love of god to forgive her for running away and that you will be a kind master to her in future captain i said i was used as well as i deserved and that i ought to be punished for running away i then took courage and said that i could stand the floggings no longer that i was weary of my life and therefore i had run away to my mother but mothers could only weep and mourn over their children they could not save them from cruel masters from the whip the rope and the cowskin he told me to hold my tongue and go about my work or he would find a way to settle me he did not however flog me that day for five years after this i remained in his house and almost daily received the same harsh treatment at length he put me on board a sloop and to my great joy sent me away to turk's island i was not permitted to see my mother or father or poor sisters and brothers to say good-bye though going away to a strange land and might never see them again oh the buckra people who keep slaves think that black people are like cattle without natural affection but my heart tells me it is far otherwise we were nearly four weeks on the voyage which was unusually long sometimes we had a light breeze sometimes a great calm and the ship made no way so that our provisions and water ran very low and we were put upon short allowance i should almost have been starved had it not been for the kindness of a black man called antony and his wife who had brought their own victuals and shared them with me when we went ashore at the grand quay the captain sent me to the house of my new master mr d to whom captain i had sold me grand quay is a small town upon a sandbank the houses low and built of wood such was my new master's 
the first person i saw on my arrival was mr d a stout sulky-looking man who carried me through the hall to show me to his wife and children next day i was put up by the vendue master to know how much i was worth and i was valued at one hundred pounds currency my new master was one of the owners or holders of the salt ponds and he received a certain sum for every slave that worked upon his premises whether they were young or old this sum was allowed him out of the profits arising from the salt works i was immediately sent to work in the salt water with the rest of the slaves this work was perfectly new to me i was given a half-barrel and a shovel and had to stand up to my knees in the water from four o'clock in the morning till nine when we were given some indian corn boiled in water which we were obliged to swallow as fast as we could for fear the rain should come on and melt the salt we were then called again to our tasks and worked through the heat of the day the sun flaming upon our heads like fire and raising salt blisters in those parts which were not completely covered our feet and legs from standing in the salt water for so many hours soon became full of dreadful boils which eat down in some cases to the very bone afflicting the sufferers with great torment we came home at twelve ate our corn soup called blawley as fast as we could and went back to our employment till dark at night we then shovelled up the salt in large heaps and went down to the sea where we washed the pickle from our limbs and cleaned the barrows and shovels from the salt when we returned to the house our master gave us each our allowance of raw indian corn which we pounded in a mortar and boiled in water for our suppers we slept in a long shed divided into narrow slips like the stalls used for cattle boards fixed upon stakes driven into the ground without mat or covering were our only beds on sundays after we had washed the salt bags and done other work required of us we went into the bush and cut the long soft grass of which we made trusses for our legs and feet to rest upon for they were so full of the salt boils that we could get no rest lying upon the bare boards though we worked from morning till night there was no satisfying mr d i hoped when i left captain i that i should have been better off but i found it was but going from one butcher to another there was this difference between them my former master used to beat me while raging and foaming with passion mr d was usually quite calm he would stand by and give orders for a slave to be cruelly whipped and assist in the punishment without moving a muscle of his face walking about and taking snuff with the greatest composure nothing could touch his hard heart neither sighs nor tears nor prayers nor streaming blood he was deaf to our cries and careless of our sufferings mr d has often stripped me naked hung me up by the wrists and beat me with the cowskin with his own hand till my body was raw with gashes yet there was nothing very remarkable in this for it might serve as a sample of the common usage of the slaves on that horrible island owing to the boils in my feet i was unable to wheel the barrow fast through the sand which got into the sores and made me stumble at every step and my master having no pity for my sufferings from this cause rendered them far more intolerable by chastising me for not being able to move so fast as he wished me another of our employments was to row a little way off from the shore in a boat and dive for large stones to build a wall round our master's house this was very hard work and the great waves breaking over us continually made us often so giddy that we lost our footing and were in danger of being drowned ah poor me my tasks were never ended sick or well it was work 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 after the diving season was over we were sent to the south creek with large bills to cut up mangoes to burn lime with whilst one party of slaves were thus employed another were sent to the other side of the island to break up coral out of the sea when we were ill let our complaint be what it might 
the only medicine given to us was a great bowl of hot salt water with salt mixed with it which made us very sick if we could not keep up with the rest of the gang of slaves we were put in the stocks and severely flogged the next morning yet not the less our master expected after we had thus been kept from our rest and our limbs rendered stiff and sore with ill usage that we should still go through the ordinary tasks of the day all the same sometimes we had to work all night measuring salt to load a vessel or turning a machine to draw water out of the sea for the salt making then we had no sleep no rest but were forced to work as fast as we could and go on again all next day the same as usual work 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 oh that turk's island was a horrible place the people in england i am sure have never found out what is carried on there cruel horrible place mr d had a slave called old daniel whom he used to treat in the most cruel manner poor daniel was lame in the hip and could not keep up with the rest of the slaves and our master would order him to be stripped and laid down on the ground and have him beaten with a rod of rough briar till his skin was quite red and raw he would then call for a bucket of salt and fling upon the raw flesh till the man writhed on the ground like a worm and screamed aloud with agony this poor man's wounds were never healed and i have often seen them full of maggots which increased his torments to an intolerable degree he was an object of pity and terror to the whole gang of slaves and in his wretched case we saw each of us our own lot if we should live to be as old oh the horrors of slavery how the thought of it pains my heart but the truth ought to be told of it and what my eyes have seen i think it is my duty to relate for few people in england know what slavery is i have been a slave i have felt what a slave feels and i know what a slave knows and i would have all the good people in england to know it too that they may break our chains and set us free mr d had another slave called ben he being very hungry stole a little rice one night after he came in from work and cooked it for his supper but his master soon discovered the theft and locked him up all night and kept him without food till one o'clock the next day then he hung ben up by his hands and beat him from time to time till the slaves came in at night we found the poor creature hung up when we came home with a pool of blood beneath him and our master still licking him but this was not the worst my master's son was in the habit of stealing the rice and rum ben had seen him do this and thought he might do the same and when master found out that ben had stolen the rice and swore to punish him he tried to excuse himself by saying that master dicky did the same thing every night the lad denied it to his father and was so angry with ben for informing against him that out of revenge he ran and got a bayonet and whilst the poor wretch was suspended by his hands and writhing under his wounds he ran it quite through his foot i was not by when he did it but i saw the wound when i came home and heard ben tell the manner in which it was done i must say something more about this cruel son of a cruel father he had no heart no fear of god he had been brought up by a bad father in a bad path and he delighted to follow in the same steps there was a little old woman among the slaves called sarah who was nearly past work and master dicky being the overseer of the slaves just then this poor creature who was subject to several bodily infirmities and was not quite right in her head did not wheel the barrow fast enough to please him he threw her down on the ground and after beating her severely he took her up in his arms and flung her among the prickly pear bushes which are all covered over with sharp venomous prickles by this her naked flesh was so grievously wounded that her body swelled and festered all over and she died a few days after in telling my own sorrows i cannot pass by those of my fellow-slaves for when i think of my own griefs i remember theirs 
i think it was about ten years i had worked in the salt ponds at turks island when my master left off business and retired to a house he had in bermuda leaving his son to succeed him in the island he took me with him to wait upon his daughters and i was joyful for i was sick sick of turks island and my heart yearned to see my native place again my mother and my kindred i had seen my poor mother during the time i was a slave in turks island one sunday morning i was on the beach with some of the slaves and we saw a sloop come in loaded with slaves to work in the salt water we got a boat and went aboard when i came upon the deck i asked the black people is there any one here for me yes they said your mother i thought they said this in jest i could scarcely believe them for joy but when i saw my poor mammy my joy was turned to sorrow for she had gone from her senses mammy i said is this you she did not know me mammy i said what's the matter she began to talk foolishly and said that she had been under the vessel's bottom they had been overtaken by a violent storm at sea my poor mother had never been on the sea before and she was so ill that she lost her senses and it was long before she came quite to herself again she had a sweet child with her a little sister i had never seen about four years of age called rebecca i took her on shore with me for i felt i should love her directly and i kept her with me a week poor little thing hers has been a sad life and continues so to this day my mother worked for some years on the island but was taken back to bermuda some time before my master carried me again thither part three after i left turks island i was told by some negroes that came over from it that the poor slaves had built up a place with boughs and leaves where they might meet for prayers but the white people pulled it down twice and would not allow them even a shed for prayers a flood came down soon after and washed away many houses filled the place with sand and overflowed the ponds and i do think that this was for their wickedness for the buckra men were very wicked i saw and heard much that was very very bad at that place i was several years the slave of mr d after i returned to my native place here i worked in the grounds my work was planting and hoeing sweet potatoes indian corn plantains bananas cabbages pumpkins onions etc i did all the household work and attended upon a horse and cow besides going also upon all errands i had to curry the horse to clean and feed him and sometimes to ride him a little i had more than enough to do but still it was not so very bad as turks island my old master often got drunk and then he would get in a fury with his daughter and beat her till she was not fit to be seen i remember on one occasion i had gone to fetch water and when i was coming up the hill i heard a great screaming i ran as fast as i could to the house put down the water and went into the chamber where i found my master beating miss d dreadfully i strove with all my strength to get her away from him for she was all black and blue with bruises he had beat her with his fist and almost killed her the people gave me credit for getting her away he turned round and began to lick me then i said sir this is not turk's island i can't repeat his answer the words were too wicked too bad to say he wanted to treat me the same in bermuda as he had done in turk's island he had an ugly fashion of stripping himself quite naked and ordering me then to wash him in a tub of water this was worse to me than all the licks sometimes when he called me to wash him i would not come my eyes were so full of shame he would then come to beat me one time i had plates and knives in my hand and i dropped both plates and knives and some of the plates were broken he struck me so severely for this that at last i defended myself for i thought it was high time to do so i then told him i would not live longer with him for he was a very indecent man very spiteful and too indecent 
with no shame for his servants no shame for his own flesh so i went away to a neighbouring house and sat down and cried till the next morning when i went home again not knowing what else to do after that i was hired to work at cedar hills and every saturday night i paid the money to my master i had plenty of work to do there plenty of washing but yet i made myself pretty comfortable i earned two dollars and a quarter a week which is twenty pence a day during the time i worked there i heard that mr john wood was going to antigua i felt a great wish to go there and i went to mr d and asked him to let me go in mr wood's service mr wood did not then want to purchase me it was my own fault that i came under him i was so anxious to go it was ordained to be i suppose god led me there the truth is i did not wish to be any longer the slave of my indecent master mr wood took me with him to antigua to the town of st john's where he lived this was about fifteen years ago he did not then know whether i was to be sold but mrs wood found that i could work and she wanted to buy me her husband then wrote to my master to inquire whether i was to be sold mr d wrote in reply that i should not be sold to any one that would treat me ill it was strange he should say this when he had treated me so ill himself so i was purchased by mr wood for three hundred dollars or one hundred pounds bermuda currency my work there was to attend the chambers and nurse the child and to go down to the pond and wash clothes but i soon fell ill of the rheumatism and grew so very lame that i was forced to walk with a stick i got the st anthony's fire also in my left leg and became quite a cripple no one cared much to come near me and i was ill a long long time for several months i could not lift the limb i had to lie in a little old outhouse that was swarming with bugs and other vermin which tormented me greatly but i had no other place to lie in i got the rheumatism by catching cold at the pond side from washing in the fresh water in the salt water i never got cold the person who lived in the next yard a mrs green could not bear to hear my cries and groans she was kind and used to send an old slave woman to help me who sometimes brought me a little soup when the doctor found i was so ill he said i must be put into a bath of hot water the old slave got the bark of some bush that was good for the pains which she boiled in the hot water and every night she came and put me into the bath and did what she could for me i don't know what i should have done or what would have become of me had it not been for her my mistress it is true did send me a little food but no one from our family came near me but the cook who used to shove my food in at the door and say molly molly there's your dinner my mistress did not care to take any trouble about me and if the lord had not put it into the hearts of the neighbours to be kind to me i must i really think have lain and died it was a long time before i got well enough to work in the house mrs wood in the meanwhile hired a mulatto woman to nurse the child but she was such a fine lady she wanted to be mistress over me i thought it very hard for a coloured woman to have rule over me because i was a slave and she was free her name was martha wilcox she was a saucy woman very saucy and she went and complained of me without cause to my mistress and made her angry with me mrs wood told me that if i did not mind what i was about she would get my master to strip me and give me fifty lashes you have been used to the whip she said and you shall have it here this was the first time she threatened to have me flogged and she gave me the threatening so strong of what she would have done to me that i thought i should have fallen down at her feet i was so vexed and hurt by her words the mulatto woman was rejoiced to have power to keep me down she was constantly making mischief there was no living for the slaves no peace after she came i was also sent by mrs wood to be put in the cage one night and was next morning flogged by the magistrate's order at her desire and this all for a quarrel i had about a pig with another slave woman i was flogged on my naked back on this occasion although i was in no fault after all 
for old justice diet when we came before him said that i was in the right and ordered the pig to be given to me this was about two or three years after i came to antigua when we moved from the middle of the town to the point i used to be in the house and do all the work and mind the children though still very ill with the rheumatism every week i had to wash two large bundles of clothes as much as a boy could help me to lift but i could give no satisfaction my mistress was always abusing and fretting after me it is not possible to tell all her ill language one day she followed me foot after foot scolding and rating me i bore in silence a great deal of ill words at last my heart was quite full and i told her that she ought not to use me so that when i was ill i might have lain and died for what she cared and no one would then come near me to nurse me because they were afraid of my mistress this was a great affront she called her husband and told him what i had said he flew into a passion but did not beat me then he only abused and swore at me and then gave me a note and bade me go and look for an owner not that he meant to sell me but he did this to please his wife and to frighten me i went to adam white a cooper a free black who had money and asked him to buy me he went directly to mr wood but was informed that i was not to be sold the next day my master whipped me another time about five years ago my mistress got vexed with me because i fell sick and i could not keep on with my work she complained to her husband and he sent me off again to look for an owner i went to a mr birchill showed him the note and asked him to buy me for my own benefit for i had saved about one hundred dollars and hoped with a little help to purchase my freedom he accordingly went to my master mr wood he said molly has brought me a note that she wants an owner if you intend to sell her i may as well buy her as another my master put him off and said that he did not mean to sell me i was very sorry at this for i had no comfort with mrs wood and i wished greatly to get my freedom the way in which i made my money was this when my master and mistress went from home as they sometimes did and left me to take care of the house and premises i had a good deal of time to myself and made the most of it i took in washing and sold coffee and yams and other provisions to the captains of ships i did not sit still idling during the absence of my owners for i wanted by all honest means to earn money to buy my freedom sometimes i bought a hog cheap on board ship and sold it for double the money on shore and i also earned a good deal by selling coffee by this means i by degrees acquired a little cash a gentleman also lent me some to help to buy my freedom but when i could not get free he got it back again his name was captain abbott my master and mistress went on one occasion into the country to date hill for change of air and carried me with them to take charge of the children and to do the work of the house while i was in the country i saw how the field negroes are worked in antigua they are worked very hard and fed but scantily they are called out to work before daybreak and come home after dark and then each has to heave his bundle of grass for the cattle in the pen then on sunday morning each slave has to go out and gather a large bundle of grass and when they bring it home they have all to sit at the manager's door and wait till he come out often have they to wait there till past eleven o'clock without any breakfast after that those that have yams or potatoes or firewood to sell hasten to market to buy a dog's worth of salt fish or pork which is a great treat for them some of them buy a little pickle out of the shad barrels which they call sauce to season their yams and indian corn it is very wrong i know to work on sunday or go to market but will not god call the buckramen to answer for this on the great day of judgment since they will give the slaves no other day while we were at date hill christmas came and the slave woman who had the care of the place which then belonged to mr roberts the marshal asked me to go with her to her husband's house to a methodist meeting for prayer at a plantation called winthorpe's i went and they were the first prayers i ever understood 
one woman prayed and then they all sung a hymn then there was another prayer and another hymn and then they all spoke by turns of their own griefs as sinners the husband of the woman i went with was a black driver his name was henry he confessed that he had treated the slaves very cruelly but said that he was compelled to obey the orders of his master he prayed them all to forgive him and he prayed that god would forgive him he said it was a horrid thing for a ranger to have sometimes to beat his own wife or sister but he must do so if ordered by his master i felt sorry for my sins also i cried the whole night but i was too much ashamed to speak i prayed god to forgive me this meeting had a great impression on my mind and led my spirit to the moravian church so that when i got back to town i went and prayed to have my name put down in the missionary's book and i followed the church earnestly every opportunity i did not then tell my mistress about it for i knew that she would not give me leave to go but i felt i must go whenever i carried the children their lunch at school i ran round and went to hear the teachers the moravian ladies mrs richter mrs olufsen and mrs souter taught me to read in the class and i got on very fast in this class there were all sorts of people old and young grey-headed folks and children but most of them were free people after we had done spelling we tried to read in the bible after the reading was over the missionary gave out a hymn for us to sing i dearly loved to go to the church it was so solemn i never knew rightly that i had much sin till i went there when i found out that i was a great sinner i was very sorely grieved and very much frightened i used to pray god to pardon my sins for christ's sake and forgive me for everything i had done amiss and when i went home to my work i always thought about what i had heard from the missionaries and wished to be good that i might go to heaven after a while i was admitted a candidate for the holy communion i had been baptized long before this in august eighteen hundred and seventeen by the rev mr curtin of the english church after i had been taught to repeat the creed and the lord's prayer i wished at that time to attend a sunday school taught by mr curtin but he would not receive me without a written note from my master granting his permission i did not ask my owner's permission from the belief that it would be refused so that i got no farther instruction at that time from the english church some time after i began to attend the moravian church i met with daniel james afterwards my dear husband he was a carpenter and cooper to his trade an honest hard-working decent black man and a widower he had purchased his freedom of his mistress old mrs baker with money he had earned whilst a slave when he asked me to marry him i took time to consider the matter over with myself and would not say yes till he went to church with me and joined the moravians he was very industrious after he bought his freedom and he had hired a comfortable house and had convenient things about him we were joined in marriage about christmas eighteen hundred and twenty six in the moravian chapel at spring gardens by the rev mr olufsen we could not be married in the english church english marriage is not allowed to slaves and no free man can marry a slave woman when mr wood heard of my marriage he flew into a great rage and sent for daniel who was helping to build a house for his old mistress mr wood asked him who gave him a right to marry a slave of his my husband said sir i am a free man and thought i had a right to choose a wife but if i had known molly was not allowed to have a husband i should not have asked her to marry me mrs wood was more vexed about my marriage than her husband she could not forgive me for getting married but stirred up mr wood to flog me dreadfully with the horsewhip i thought it very hard to be whipped at my time of life for getting a husband i told her so she said that she would not have nigger men about the yards and premises or allow a nigger man's clothes to be washed in the same tub where hers were washed she was fearful i think 
that i should lose her time in order to wash and do things for my husband but i had then no time to wash for myself i was obliged to put out my own clothes though i was always at the wash-tub i had not much happiness in my marriage owing to my being a slave it made my husband sad to see me so ill-treated mrs wood was always abusing me about him she did not lick me herself but she got her husband to do it for her whilst she fretted the flesh off my bones yet for all this she would not sell me she sold five slaves whilst i was with her but though she was always finding fault with me she would not part with me however mr wood afterwards allowed daniel to have a place to live in our yard which we were very thankful for after this i fell ill again with the rheumatism and was sick a long time but whether sick or well i had my work to do about this time i asked my master and mistress to let me buy my own freedom with the help of mr burchell i could have found the means to pay mr wood for it was agreed that i should afterwards serve mr burchell a while for the cash he was to advance for me i was earnest in the request to my owners but their hearts were hard too hard to consent mrs wood was very angry she grew quite outrageous she called me a black devil and asked who had put freedom into my head to be free is very sweet i said but she took good care to keep me a slave i saw her change colour and i left the room part four about this time my master and mistress were going to england to put their son to school and bring their daughters home and they took me with them to take care of the child i was willing to come to england i thought that by going there i should probably get cured of my rheumatism and should return with my master and mistress quite well to my husband my husband was willing for me to come away for he had heard that my master would free me and i also hoped this might prove true but it was all a false report the steward of the ship was very kind to me he and my husband were in the same class in the moravian church i was thankful that he was so friendly for my mistress was not kind to me on the passage and she told me when she was angry that she did not intend to treat me any better in england than in the west indies that i need not expect it and she was as good as her word when we drew near to england the rheumatism seized all my limbs worse than ever and my body was dreadfully swelled when we landed at the tower i showed my flesh to my mistress but she took no great notice of it we were obliged to stop at the tavern till my master got a house and a day or two after my mistress sent me down into the wash-house to learn to wash in the english way in the west indies we wash with cold water in england with hot i told my mistress i was afraid that putting my hands first into the hot water and then into the cold would increase the pain in my limbs the doctor had told my mistress long before i came from the west indies that i was a sickly body and the washing did not agree with me but mrs wood would not release me from the tub so i was forced to do as i could i grew worse and could not stand to wash i was then forced to sit down with the tub before me and often through pain and weakness was reduced to kneel or to sit down on the floor to finish my task when i complained to my mistress of this she only got into a passion as usual and said washing in hot water could not hurt any one that i was lazy and insolent and wanted to be free of my work but that she would make me do it i thought her very hard on me and my heart rose up within me however i kept still at that time and went down again to wash the child's things but the english washerwomen who were at work there when they saw that i was so ill had pity upon me and washed them for me after that when we came up to live in lee street mrs wood sorted out five bags of clothes which we had used at sea and also such as had been worn since we came on shore for me and the cook to wash elizabeth the cook told her that she did not think that i was able to stand to the tub and that she had better hire a woman i also said myself 
that i had come over to nurse the child and that i was sorry i had come from antigua since mistress would work me so hard without compassion for my rheumatism mr and mrs wood when they heard this rose up in a passion against me they opened the door and bade me get out but i was a stranger and did not know one door in the street from another and was unwilling to go away they made a dreadful uproar and from that day they constantly kept cursing and abusing me i was obliged to wash though i was very ill mrs wood indeed once hired a washerwoman but she was not well treated and would come no more my master quarrelled with me another time about one of our great washings his wife having stirred him up to do so he said he would compel me to do the whole of the washing given out to me or if i again refused he would take a short course with me he would either send me down to the brig in the river to carry me back to antigua or he would turn me at once out of doors and let me provide for myself i said i would willingly go back if he would let me purchase my own freedom but this enraged him more than all the rest he cursed and swore at me dreadfully and said he would never sell my freedom if i wished to be free i was free in england and i might go and try what freedom would do for me and be damned my heart was very sore with this treatment but i had to go on i continued to do my work and did all i could to give satisfaction but all would not do shortly after the cook left them and then matters went on ten times worse i always washed the child's clothes without being commanded to do it and anything else that was wanted in the family though still i was very sick very sick indeed when the great washing came round which was every two months my mistress got together again a great many heavy things such as bed ticks bed coverlets etc for me to wash I told her I was too ill to wash such heavy things that day. She said she supposed I thought myself a free woman, but I was not, and if I did not do it directly, I should be instantly turned out of doors. I stood a long time before I could answer, for I did not know well what to do. I knew that I was free in England, but I did not know where to go or how to get my living, and therefore I did not like to leave the house but mr wood said he would send for a constable to thrust me out and at last i took courage and resolved that i would not be longer thus treated but would go and trust to providence this was the fourth time they had threatened to turn me out and go where i might i was determined now to take them at their word though i thought it very hard after i had lived with them for thirteen years and worked for them like a horse to be driven out in this way like a beggar my only fault was being sick and therefore unable to please my mistress who thought she never could get work enough out of her slaves and so i told them but they only abused me and drove me out this took place from two to three months i think after we came to england when i came away i went to the man one mash who used to black the shoes of the family and asked his wife to get somebody to go with me to hatton gardens to the moravian missionaries these were the only persons i knew in england the woman sent a young girl with me to the mission house and i saw there a gentleman called mr moore i told him my whole story and how my owners had treated me and asked him to take in my trunk with what few clothes i had the missionaries were very kind to me they were sorry for my destitute situation and gave me leave to bring my things to be placed under their care they were very good people and they told me to come to the church when i went back to mr wood's to get my trunk i saw a lady mrs pell who was on a visit to my mistress when mr and mrs wood heard me come in they set this lady to stop me finding that they had gone too far with me mrs pell came out to me and said are you really going to leave molly don't leave but come into the country with me i believe she said this because she thought mrs wood would easily get me back again i replied to her ma'am this is the fourth time my master and mistress have driven me out or threatened to drive me and i will give them no more occasion to bid me go 
i was not willing to leave them for i am a stranger in this country but now i must go i can stay no longer to be so used mrs pell then went upstairs to my mistress and told that i would go and that she could not stop me mrs wood was very much hurt and frightened when she found i was determined to go out that day she said if she goes the people will rob her and then turn her adrift she did not say this to me but she spoke it loud enough for me to hear that it might induce me not to go i suppose mr wood also asked me where i was going to i told him where i had been and that i should never have gone away had i not been driven out by my owners he had given me a written paper some time before which said that i had come with them to england by my own desire and that was true it said also that i left them of my own free will because i was a free woman in england and that i was idle and would not do my work which was not true i gave this paper afterwards to a gentleman who inquired into my case i went into the kitchen and got my clothes out the nurse and the servant girl were there and i said to the man who was going to take out my trunk stop before you take up this trunk and hear what i have to say before these people i am going out of this house as i was ordered but i have done no wrong at all to my owners neither here nor in the west indies i always worked very hard to please them both by night and day but there was no giving satisfaction for my mistress could never be satisfied with reasonable service i told my mistress i was sick and yet she has ordered me out of doors this is the fourth time and now i am going out and so i came out and went and carried my trunk to the moravians i then returned back to mash the shoeblack's house and begged his wife to take me in i had a little west indian money in my trunk and they got it changed for me this helped to support me for a little while the man's wife was very kind to me i was very sick and she boiled nourishing things up for me she also sent for a doctor to see me and he sent me medicine which did me good though i was ill for a long time with the rheumatic pains i lived a good many months with these poor people and they nursed me and did all that lay in their power to serve me the man was well acquainted with my situation as he used to go to and fro to mr wood's house to clean shoes and knives and he and his wife were sorry for me about this time a woman of the name of hill told me of the anti-slavery society and went with me to their office to inquire if they could do anything to get me my freedom and send me back to the west indies the gentleman of the society took me to a lawyer who examined very strictly into my case but told me that the laws of england could do nothing to make me free in antigua however they did all they could for me they gave me a little money from time to time to keep me from want and some of them went to mr wood to try to persuade him to let me return a free woman to my husband but though they offered him as i have heard a large sum for my freedom he was sulky and obstinate and would not consent to let me go free this was the first winter i spent in england and i suffered much from the severe cold and from the rheumatic pains which still at times torment me however providence was very good to me and i got many friends especially some quaker ladies who hearing of my case came and sought me out and gave me good warm clothing and money thus i had great cause to bless god in my affliction when i got better i was anxious to get some work to do as i was unwilling to eat the bread of idleness mrs mash who was a laundress recommended me to a lady for a charwoman she paid me very handsomely for what work i did and i divided the money with mrs mash for though very poor they gave me food when my own money was done and never suffered me to want in the spring i got into service with a lady who saw me at the house where i sometimes worked as a charwoman this lady's name was mrs forsyth she had been in the west indies and was accustomed to blacks and liked them i was with her six months and went with her to margate 
she treated me well and gave me a good character when she left london after mrs forsyth went away i was again out of place and went to lodgings for which i paid two shillings a week and found coals and candle after eleven weeks the money i had saved in service was all gone and i was forced to go back to the anti-slavery office to ask a supply till i could get another situation i did not like to go back i did not like to be idle i would rather work for my living than get it for nothing they were very good to give me a supply but i felt shame at being obliged to apply for relief whilst i had strength to work at last i went into the service of mr and mrs pringle where i have been ever since and am as comfortable as i can be while separated from my dear husband and away from my own country and all old friends and connections my dear mistress teaches me daily to read the word of god and takes great pains to make me understand it i enjoy the great privilege of being enabled to attend church three times on a sunday and i have met with many kind friends since i have been here both clergymen and others the rev mr young who lives in the next house has shown me much kindness and taken much pains to instruct me particularly while my master and mistress were absent in scotland nor must i forget among my friends the rev mr mortimer the good clergyman of the parish under whose ministry i have now sat for upwards of twelve months i trust in god i have profited by what i have heard from him he never keeps back the truth and i think he has been the means of opening my eyes and ears much better to understand the word of god mr mortimer tells me that he cannot open the eyes of my heart but that i must pray to god to change my heart and make me to know the truth and the truth will make me free i still live in the hope that god will find a way to give me my liberty and give me back to my husband i endeavour to keep down my fretting and leave all to him for he knows what is good for me better than i know myself yet i must confess i find it a hard and heavy task to do so i am often much vexed and i feel great sorrow when i hear some people in this country say that the slaves do not need better usage and do not want to be free they believe the foreign people who deceive them and say slaves are happy i say not so how can the slaves be happy when they have the halter round their neck and the whip upon their back and are disgraced and thought no more of than beasts and are separated from their mothers and husbands and children and sisters just as cattle are sold and separated is it happiness for a driver in the field to take down his wife or sister or child and strip them and whip them in such a disgraceful manner women that have had children exposed in the open field to shame there is no modesty or decency shown by the owner to his slaves men women and children are exposed alike since i have been here i have often wondered how english people can go out into the west indies and act in such a beastly manner but when they go to the west indies they forget god and all feeling of shame i think since they can see and do such things they tie up slaves like hogs moor them up like cattle and they lick them so as hogs or cattle or horses never were flogged and yet they come home and say and make some good people believe that slaves don't want to get out of slavery but they put a cloak about the truth it is not so all slaves want to be free to be free is very sweet i will say the truth to english people who may read this history that my good friend miss s is now writing down for me i have been a slave myself i know what slaves feel i can tell by myself what other slaves feel and by what they have told me the man that says slaves be quite happy in slavery that they don't want to be free that man is either ignorant or a lying person i never heard a slave say so i never heard a buckra man say so till i heard tell of it in england 
such people ought to be ashamed of themselves they can't do without slaves they say what's the reason they can't do without slaves as well as in england no slaves here no whips no stocks no punishment except for wicked people they hire servants in england and if they don't like them they send them away they can't lick them let them work ever so hard in england they are far better off than slaves if they get a bad master they give warning and go higher to another they have their liberty that's just what we want we don't mind hard work if we had proper treatment and proper wages like english servants and proper time given in the week to keep us from breaking the sabbath but they won't give it they will have work 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 night and day sick or well till we are quite done up and we must not speak up nor look amiss however much we be abused and then when we are quite done up who cares for us more than for a lame horse this is slavery i tell it to let english people know the truth and i hope they will never leave off to pray god and call loud to the great king of england till all the poor blacks be given free and slavery done up for evermore supplement to the history of mary prince by the editor part one leaving mary's narrative for the present without comment to the reader's reflections i proceed to state some circumstances connected with her case which have fallen more particularly under my own notice and which i consider it incumbent now to lay fully before the public about the latter end of november eighteen hundred and twenty eight this poor woman found her way to the office of the anti-slavery society in aldermanbury by the aid of a person who had become acquainted with her situation and had advised her to apply there for advice and assistance after some preliminary examination into the accuracy of the circumstances related by her i went along with her to mr george stephen solicitor and requested him to investigate and draw up a statement of her case and have it submitted to counsel in order to ascertain whether or not under the circumstances her freedom could be legally established on her return to antigua on this occasion in mr stephen's presence and mine she expressed in very strong terms her anxiety to return thither if she could go as a free person and at the same time her extreme apprehensions of the fate that would probably await her if she returned as a slave her words were i would rather go into my grave than go back a slave to antigua though i wish to go back to my husband very much very much very much i am much afraid my owners would separate me from my husband and use me very hard or perhaps sell me for a field negro and slavery is too too bad i would rather go into my grave the paper which mr wood had given her before she left his house was placed by her in mr stephen's hands it was expressed in the following terms i have already told molly and now give it her in writing in order that there may be no misunderstanding on her part that as i brought her from antigua at her own request and entreaty and that she is consequently now free she is of course at liberty to take her baggage and go where she pleases and in consequence of her late conduct she must do one of two things either quit the house or return to antigua by the earliest opportunity as she does not evince a disposition to make herself useful as she is a stranger in london i do not wish to turn her out or would do so as two female servants are sufficient for my establishment if after this she does remain it will be only during her good behaviour but on no consideration will i allow her wages or any other remuneration for her services john a wood london august eighteenth eighteen hundred and twenty eight this paper though not devoid of inconsistencies which will be apparent to any attentive reader is craftily expressed and was well devised to serve the purpose which the writer had obviously in view namely to frustrate any appeal which the friendless black woman might make to the sympathy of strangers and thus prevent her from obtaining an asylum 
if she left his house from any respectable family as she had no one to refer to for a character in this country except himself he doubtless calculated securely on her being speedily driven back as soon as the slender fund she had in her possession was expended to throw herself unconditionally upon his tender mercies and his disappointment in this expectation appears to have exasperated his feelings of resentment towards the poor woman to a degree which few persons alive to the claims of common justice not to speak of christianity or common humanity could easily have anticipated such at least seems the only intelligible inference that can be drawn from his subsequent conduct the case having been submitted by desire of the anti-slavery committee to the consideration of dr lushington and mr sergeant stephen it was found that there existed no legal means of compelling mary's master to grant her manumission and that if she returned to antigua she would inevitably fall again under his power or that of his attorneys as a slave it was however resolved to try what could be effected for her by amicable negotiation and with this view mr ravenscroft a solicitor mr stephen's relative called upon mr wood in order to ascertain whether he would consent to mary's manumission on any reasonable terms and to refer if required the amount of compensation for her value to arbitration mr ravenscroft with some difficulty obtained one or two interviews but found mr wood so full of animosity against the woman and so firmly bent against any arrangement having her freedom for its object that the negotiation was soon broken off as hopeless the angry slave owner declared that he would not move a finger about her in this country or grant her manumission on any terms whatever and that if she went back to the west indies she must take the consequences this unreasonable conduct of mr wood induced the anti-slavery committee after several other abortive attempts to effect a compromise to think of bringing the case under the notice of parliament the heads of mary's statement were accordingly engrossed in a petition which dr lushington offered to present and to give notice at the same time of his intention to bring in a bill to provide for the entire emancipation of all slaves brought to england with the owner's consent but before this step was taken dr lushington again had recourse to negotiation with the master and partly through the friendly intervention of mr manning partly by personal conference used every persuasion in his power to induce mr wood to relent and let the bondwoman go free seeing the matter thus seriously taken up mr wood became at length alarmed not relishing it appears the idea of having the case publicly discussed in the house of commons and to avert this result he submitted to temporize assumed a demeanour of unwonted civility and even hinted to mr manning as i was given to understand that if he was not driven to utter hostility by the threatened exposure he would probably meet our wishes in his own time and way having gained time by these manoeuvres he adroitly endeavoured to cool the ardour of mary's new friends in her cause by representing her as an abandoned and worthless woman ungrateful towards him and undeserving of sympathy from others allegations which he supported by the ready affirmation of some of his west india friends and by one or two plausible letters procured from antigua by these and like artifices he appears completely to have imposed on mr manning the respectable west india merchant whom dr lushington had asked to negotiate with him and he prevailed so far as to induce dr lushington himself actuated by the benevolent view of thereby best serving mary's cause to abstain from any remarks upon his conduct when the petition was at last presented in parliament in this way he dexterously contrived to neutralize all our efforts until the close of the session of eighteen twenty nine soon after which he embarked with his family for the west indies every exertion for mary's relief having thus failed and being fully convinced from a twelve months observation of her conduct that she was really a well-disposed and respectable woman i engaged her in december eighteen hundred and twenty nine as a domestic servant in my own family in this capacity she has remained ever since and i am less enabled to speak of her conduct and character with a degree of confidence i could not have otherwise done the importance of this circumstance will appear in the sequel 
from the time of mr wood's departure to antigua in eighteen hundred and twenty nine till june or july last no farther effort was attempted for mary's relief some faint hope was still cherished that this unconscionable man would at length relent and in his own time and way grant the prayer of the exiled negro woman after waiting however nearly twelve months longer and seeing the poor woman's spirits daily sinking under the sickening influence of hope deferred i resolved on a final attempt in her behalf through the intervention of the moravian missionaries and of the governor of antigua at my request mr edward moore agent of the moravian brethren in london wrote to the rev joseph newby their missionary in that island empowering him to negotiate in his own name with mr wood for mary's manumission and to procure his consent if possible upon terms of ample pecuniary compensation at the same time the excellent and benevolent william allen of the society of friends wrote to sir patrick ross the governor of the colony with whom he was on terms of friendship soliciting him to use his influence in persuading mr wood to consent and i confess i was sanguine enough to flatter myself that we should thus at length prevail the result proved however that i had not yet fully appreciated the character of the man we had to deal with mr newby's answer arrived early in november last mentioning that he had done all in his power to accomplish our purpose but in vain and that if mary's manumission could not be obtained without mr wood's consent he believed there was no prospect of its ever being effected a few weeks afterwards i was informed by mr allen that he had received a letter from sir patrick ross stating that he also had used his best endeavours in the affair but equally without effect sir patrick at the same time enclosed a letter addressed by mr wood to his secretary mr taylor assigning his reasons for persisting in this extraordinary course this letter requires our special attention its tenor is as follows my dear sir in reply to your note relative to the woman molly i beg you will have the kindness to oblige me by assuring his excellency that i regret exceedingly my inability to comply with his request which under other circumstances would afford me very great pleasure there are many and powerful reasons for inducing me to refuse my sanction to her returning here in the way she seems to wish it would be to reward the worst species of ingratitude and subject myself to insult whenever she came in my way her moral character is very bad as the police records will show and she would be a very troublesome character should she come here without any restraint she is not a native of this country and i know of no relation she has here i induced her to take a husband a short time before she left this by providing a comfortable house in my yard for them and prohibiting her going out after ten to twelve o'clock our bedtime without special leave this she considered the greatest and indeed the only grievance she ever complained of and all my efforts could not prevent it in hopes of inducing her to be steady to her husband who was a free man i gave him the house to occupy during our absence but it appears the attachment was too loose to bind her and he has taken another wife so on that score i do her no injury in england she made her election and quitted my family this i had no right to object to and i should have thought no more of it but not satisfied to leave quietly she gave every trouble and annoyance in her power and endeavoured to injure the character of my family by the most vile and infamous falsehoods which was embodied in a petition to the house of commons and would have been presented had not my friends from this island particularly the honourable mr byam and dr cool come forward and disproved what she had asserted it would be beyond the limits of an ordinary letter to detail her baseness though i will do so should his excellency wish it but you may judge of her depravity by one circumstance which came out before mr justice diet in a quarrel with another female such a thing i could not have believed possible losing her value as a slave in a pecuniary point of view i consider of no consequence for it was our intention had she conducted herself properly and returned with us to have given her freedom she has taken her freedom and all i wish is that she would enjoy it without meddling with me let me again repeat if his excellency wishes it it will afford me great pleasure to state such particulars of her and which will be incontestably proved by numbers here 
that i am sure will acquit me in his opinion of acting unkind or ungenerous towards her i'll say nothing of the liability i should incur under the consolidated slave law of dealing with a free person as a slave my only excuse for entering so much into detail must be that of my anxious wish to stand justified in his excellency's opinion i am my dear sir yours very truly john a wood twentieth of october eighteen hundred and thirty charles taylor esq etc 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 i forgot to mention that it was at her own special request that she accompanied me to england and also that she had a considerable sum of money with her which she had saved in my service i knew of thirty six pounds to forty pounds at least for i had some trouble to recover it from a white man to whom she had lent it j a w such is mr wood's justification of his conduct in thus obstinately refusing manumission to the negro woman who had escaped from his house of bondage part two let us now endeavour to estimate the validity of the excuses assigned and the allegations advanced by him for the information of governor sir patrick ross in this deliberate statement of his case one to allow the woman to return home free would he affirms be to reward the worst species of ingratitude he assumes it seems the sovereign power of pronouncing a virtual sentence of banishment for the alleged crime of ingratitude is this then a power which any man ought to possess over his fellow-mortal or which any good man would ever wish to exercise and besides there is no evidence whatever beyond mr wood's mere assertion that mary prince owed him or his family the slightest mark of gratitude her account of the treatment she received in his service may be incorrect but her simple statement is at least supported by minute and feasible details and unless rebutted by positive facts will certainly command credence from impartial minds more readily than his angry accusation which has something absurd and improbable in its very front moreover is it not absurd to term the assertion of her natural rights by a slave even supposing her to have been kindly dealt with by her owners and treated in every respect the reverse of what mary affirms to have been her treatment by mr wood and his wife the worst species of ingratitude this may be west indian ethics but it will scarcely be received as sound doctrine in europe two to permit her return would be to subject himself to insult whenever she came in his way this is a most extraordinary assertion are the laws of antigua then so favourable to the free blacks or the colonial police so feebly administered that there are no sufficient restraints to protect a rich colonist like mr wood a man who counts among his familiar friends the hon mr byam and mr taylor the government secretary from being insulted by a poor negro woman it is preposterous three her moral character is so bad that she would prove very troublesome should she come to the colony without any restraint any restraint are there no restraints supposing them necessary short of absolute slavery to keep troublesome characters in order but this i suppose is the argumentum ad gubernatorum to frighten the governor she is such a termagant it seems that if she once gets back to the colony free she will not only make it too hot for poor mr wood but the police and courts of justice will scarce be a match for her sir patrick ross no doubt will take care how he intercedes farther for so formidable a virago how can one treat such arguments seriously Four she is not a native of the colony and he knows of no relation she has there true but was it not her home so far as a slave can have a home for thirteen or fourteen years were not the connections friendships and associations of her mature life formed there was it not there she hoped to spend her latter years in domestic tranquillity with her husband free from the lash of the taskmaster 
these considerations may appear light to mr wood but they are everything to this poor woman five he induced her he says to take a husband a short time before she left antigua and gave them a comfortable house in his yard etc etc this paragraph merits attention he induced her to take a husband if the fact were true what brutality of mind and manners does it not indicate among these slaveholders they refuse to legalize the marriages of their slaves but induce them to form such temporary connections as may suit the owner's conveniency just as they would pair the lower animals and this man has the effrontery to tell us so mary however tells a very different story see page seventeen and her assertion independently of other proof is at least as credible as mr wood's the reader will judge for himself as to the preponderance of internal evidence in the conflicting statements six he alleges that she was before marriage licentious and even depraved in her conduct and unfaithful to her husband afterwards these are serious charges but if true or even partially true how comes it that a person so correct in his family hours and arrangements as mr wood professes to be and who expresses so edifying a horror of licentiousness could reconcile it to his conscience to keep in the bosom of his family so depraved as well as so troublesome a character for at least thirteen years and to confide to her for long periods too the charge of his house and the care of his children for such i shall show to have been the facts how can he account for not having rid himself with all speed of so disreputable an inmate he who values her loss so little in a pecuniary point of view how can he account for having sold five other slaves in that period and yet have retained this shocking woman nay even have refused to sell her on more than one occasion when offered her full value it could not be from ignorance of her character for the circumstance which he adduces as a proof of her shameless depravity and which i have omitted on account of its indecency occurred it would appear not less than ten years ago yet notwithstanding her alleged ill qualities and habits of gross immorality he has not only constantly refused to part with her but after thirteen long years brings her to england as an attendant on his wife and children with the avowed intention of carrying her back along with his maiden daughter a young lady returning from school such are the extraordinary facts and until mr wood shall reconcile these singular inconsistencies between his actions and his allegations he must not be surprised if we in england prefer giving credit to the former rather than the latter although at present it appears somewhat difficult to say which side of the alternative is the more creditable to his own character seven her husband he says has taken another wife so that on that score he adds he does her no injury supposing this fact to be true which i doubt as i doubt every mere assertion from so questionable a quarter i shall take leave to put a question or two to mr wood's conscience did he not write from england to his friend mr darrell soon after mary left his house directing him to turn her husband daniel james off his premises on account of her offence telling him to inform james at the same time that his wife had taken up with another man who had robbed her of all she had a calumny as groundless as it was cruel i further ask if the person who invented this story whoever he may be was not likely enough to impose similar fabrications on the poor negro man's credulity until he may have been induced to prove false to his marriage vows and to take another wife as mr wood coolly expresses it but withal i strongly doubt the fact of daniel james infidelity for there is now before me a letter from himself to mary dated in april eighteen hundred and thirty couched in strong terms of conjugal affection expressing his anxiety for her speedy return and stating that he had lately received a grace 
a token of religious advancement in the moravian church a circumstance altogether incredible if the man were living in open adultery as mr wood's assertion implies eight mary he says endeavoured to injure the character of his family by infamous falsehoods which were embodied in a petition to the house of commons and would have been presented had not his friends from antigua the hon mr byam and dr cool disproved her assertions i can say something on this point from my own knowledge mary's petition contained simply a brief statement of her case and among other things mentioned the treatment she had received from mr and mrs wood now the principal facts are corroborated by other evidence and mr wood must bring forward very different testimony from that of dr cool before well-informed persons will give credit to his contradiction the value of that person's evidence in such cases will be noticed presently of the honourable mr byam i know nothing and shall only at present remark that it is not likely to redound greatly to his credit to appear in such company furthermore mary's petition was presented as mr wood ought to know though it was not discussed nor his conduct exposed as it ought to have been nine he speaks of the liability he should incur under the consolidated slave law of dealing with a free person as a slave is not this pretext hypocritical in the extreme what liability could he possibly incur by voluntarily resigning the power conferred on him by an iniquitous colonial law of reimposing the shackles of slavery on the bondwoman from whose limbs they had fallen when she touched the free soil of england there exists no liability from which he might not have been easily secured or for which he would not have been fully compensated he adds in a postscript that mary had a considerable sum of money with her from thirty-six to forty pounds at least which she had saved in his service the fact is that she had at one time one hundred and thirteen dollars in cash but only a very small portion of that sum appears to have been brought by her to england the rest having been partly advanced as she states to assist her husband and partly lost by being lodged in unfaithful custody finally mr wood repeats twice that it will afford him great pleasure to state for the governor's satisfaction if required such particulars of the woman molly upon incontestable evidence as he is sure will acquit him in his excellency's opinion of acting unkind or ungenerous towards her this is well and i now call upon mr wood to redeem his pledge to bring forward facts and proofs fully to elucidate the subject to reconcile if he can the extraordinary discrepancies which i have pointed out between his assertions and the actual facts and especially between his account of mary prince's character and his own conduct in regard to her he has now to produce such a statement as will acquit him not only in the opinion of sir patrick ross but of the british public and in this position he has spontaneously placed himself in attempting to destroy by his deliberate criminatory letter the poor woman's fair fame and reputation an attempt but for which the present publication would probably never have appeared here perhaps we might safely leave the case to the judgment of the public but as this negro woman's character not the less valuable to her because her condition is so humble has been so unscrupulously blackened by her late master a party so much interested and inclined to place her in the worst point of view it is incumbent on me as her advocate with the public to state such additional testimony in her behalf as i can fairly and conscientiously adduce part three my first evidence is mr joseph phillips of antigua having submitted to his inspection mr wood's letter and mary prince's narrative and requested his candid and deliberate sentiments in regard to the actual facts of the case i have been favoured with the following letter from him on the subject london january eighteenth eighteen hundred and thirty one dear sir in giving you my opinion of mary prince's narrative and of mr wood's letter respecting her addressed to mr taylor 
i shall first mention my opportunities of forming a proper estimate of the conduct and character of both parties i have known mr wood since his first arrival in antigua in eighteen hundred and three he was then a poor young man who had been brought up as a ship carpenter in bermuda he was afterwards raised to be a clerk in the commissariat department and realized sufficient capital to commence business as a merchant this last profession he has followed successfully for a good many years and is understood to have accumulated very considerable wealth after he entered into trade i had constant intercourse with him in the way of business and in eighteen hundred and twenty four and eighteen hundred and twenty five i was regularly employed on his premises as his clerk consequently i had opportunities of seeing a good deal of his character both as a merchant and as a master of slaves the former topic i shall pass over as irrelevant to the present subject in reference to the latter i shall merely observe that he was not in regard to ordinary matters more severe than the ordinary run of slave owners but if seriously offended he was not of a disposition to be easily appeased and would spare no cost or sacrifice to gratify his vindictive feelings as regards the exaction of work from domestic slaves his wife was probably more severe than himself it was almost impossible for the slaves ever to give her entire satisfaction of their slave molly or mary i know less than of mr and mrs wood but i saw and heard enough of her both while i was constantly employed on mr wood's premises and while i was there occasionally on business to be quite certain that she was viewed by her owners as their most respectable and trustworthy female slave it is within my personal knowledge that she had usually the charge of the house in their absence was entrusted with the keys etc and was always considered by the neighbours and visitors as their confidential household servant and as a person in whose integrity they placed unlimited confidence although when mrs wood was at home she was no doubt kept pretty closely at washing and other hard work a decided proof of the estimation in which she was held by her owners exists in the fact that mr wood uniformly refused to part with her whereas he sold five other slaves while she was with them indeed she always appeared to me to be a slave of superior intelligence and respectability and i always understood such to be her general character in the place as to what mr wood alleges about her being frequently before the police etc i can only say i never heard of the circumstance before and as i lived for twenty years in the same small town and in the vicinity of their residence i think i could scarcely have failed to become acquainted with it had such been the fact she might however have been occasionally before the magistrate in consequence of little disputes among the slaves without any serious imputation on her general respectability she says she was twice summoned to appear as a witness on such occasions and that she was once sent by her mistress to be confined in the cage and was afterwards flogged by her desire this cruel practice is very common in antigua and in my opinion is but little creditable to the slave owners and magistrates by whom such arbitrary punishments are inflicted frequently for very trifling faults mr james scotland is the only magistrate in the colony who invariably refuses to sanction this reprehensible practice of the immoral conduct ascribed to molly by mr wood i can say nothing further than this that i have heard she had at a former period previous to her marriage a connection with a white person a captain which i have no doubt was broken off when she became seriously impressed with religion but at any rate such connections are so common i might almost say universal in our slave colonies that except by the missionaries and a few serious persons they are considered if faults at all so very venial as scarcely to deserve the name of immorality mr wood knows this colonial estimate of such connections as well as i do and however false such an estimate must be allowed to be especially when applied to their own conduct by persons of education pretending to adhere to the pure christian rule of morals yet when he ascribes to a negro slave to whom legal marriage was denied such great criminality for laxity of this sort and professes to be so exceedingly shocked and amazed at the tale he himself relates he must i am confident 
have had a farther object in view than the information of mr taylor or sir patrick ross he must it is evident have been aware that his letter would be sent to mr allen and accordingly adapted it as more important documents from the colonies are often adapted for effect in england the tale of the slave molly's immoralities be assured was not intended for antigua so much as for stoke newington and peckham and aldermanbury in regard to mary's narrative generally although i cannot speak to the accuracy of the details except in a few recent particulars i can with safety declare that i see no reason to question the truth of a single fact stated by her or even to suspect her in any instance of intentional exaggeration it bears in my judgment the genuine stamp of truth and nature such is my unhesitating opinion after a residence of twenty-seven years in the west indies to t pringle esq i remain etc joseph phillips p s as mr wood refers to the evidence of dr t cool in opposition to mary's assertions it may be proper to enable you justly to estimate the worth of that person's evidence in cases connected with the condition and treatment of slaves you are aware that in eighteen hundred and twenty nine mr mcqueen of glasgow in noticing a report of the ladies society of birmingham for the relief of british negro slaves asserted with his characteristic audacity that the statement which it contained respecting distressed and deserted slaves in antigua was an abominable falsehood not contented with this and with insinuating that i as agent of the society in the distribution of their charity in antigua had fraudulently duped them out of their money by a fabricated tale of distress mr mcqueen proceeded to libel me in the most opprobrious terms as a man of the most worthless and abandoned character now i know from good authority that it was upon dr cool's information that mr mcqueen founded this impudent contradiction of notorious facts and this audacious libel of my personal character from this single circumstance you may judge of the value of his evidence in the case of mary prince i can furnish further information respecting dr cool's colonial proceedings both private and judicial should circumstances require it j p i leave the preceding letter to be candidly weighed by the reader in opposition to the inculpatory allegations of mr wood merely remarking that mr wood will find it somewhat difficult to impugn the evidence of mr phillips whose upright unimpeached and unexceptionable character he has himself vouched for in unqualified terms by affixing his signature to the testimonial published in the weekly register of antigua in eighteen hundred and twenty five the next testimony in mary's behalf is that of mrs forsyth a lady in whose service she spent the summer of eighteen hundred and twenty nine see page twenty one this lady on leaving london to join her husband voluntarily presented mary with a certificate which though it relates only to a recent and short period of her history is a strong corroboration of the habitual respectability of her character it is in the following terms mrs forsyth states that the bearer of this paper mary james has been with her for the last six months that she has found her an excellent character being honest industrious and sober and that she parts with her on no other account than this that being obliged to travel with her husband who has lately come from abroad in bad health she has no farther need of a servant any person wishing to engage her can have her character in full from miss robson four keppel street russell square whom mrs forsyth has requested to furnish particulars to any one desiring them four keppel street twenty eighth of september eighteen hundred and twenty nine in the last place i add my own testimony in behalf of this negro woman independently of the scrutiny which as secretary of the anti-slavery society i made into her case when she first applied for assistance at eighteen aldermanbury and the watchful eye i kept upon her conduct for the ensuing twelve months while she was the occasional pensioner of the society 
i have now had the opportunity of closely observing her conduct for fourteen months in the situation of a domestic servant in my own family and the following is the deliberate opinion of mary's character formed not only by myself but also by my wife and sister-in-law after the sample period of observation we have found her perfectly honest and trustworthy in all respects so that we have no hesitation in leaving everything in the house at her disposal she had the entire charge of the house during our absence in scotland for three months last autumn and conducted herself in that charge with the utmost discretion and fidelity she is not it is true a very expert housemaid nor capable of much hard work for her constitution appears to be a good deal broken but she is careful industrious and anxious to do her duty and to give satisfaction she is capable of strong attachments and feels deep though unobtrusive gratitude for real kindness shown her she possesses considerable natural sense and has much quickness of observation and discrimination of character she is remarkable for decency and propriety of conduct and her delicacy even in trifling minutiae has been a trait of special remark by the females of my family this trait which is obviously quite unaffected would be a most inexplicable anomaly if her former habits had been so indecent and depraved as mr wood alleges her chief faults so far as we have discovered them are a somewhat violent and hasty temper and a considerable share of natural pride and self-importance but these defects have been but rarely and transiently manifested and have scarcely occasioned an hour's uneasiness at any time in our household her religious knowledge notwithstanding the pious care of her moravian instructors in antigua is still but very limited and her views of christianity indistinct but her profession whatever it may have of imperfection i am convinced has nothing of insincerity in short we consider her on the whole as respectable and well-behaved a person in her station as any domestic white or black and we have had ample experience of both colours that we have ever had in our service part four but after all mary's character important though its exculpation be to her is not really the point of chief practical interest in this case suppose all mr wood's defamatory allegations to be true suppose him to be able to rake up against her out of the records of the antigua police or from the veracious testimony of his brother colonists twenty stories as bad or worse than what he insinuates suppose the whole of her own statement to be false and even the whole of her conduct since she came under our observation here to be a tissue of hypocrisy suppose all this and leave the negro woman as black in character as in complexion yet it would not affect the main facts which are these one mr wood not daring in england to punish this woman arbitrarily as he would have done in the west indies drove her out of his house or left her at least only the alternative of returning instantly to antigua with the certainty of severe treatment there or submitting in silence to what she considered intolerable usage in his household two he has since obstinately persisted in refusing her manumission to enable her to return home in security though repeatedly offered more than ample compensation for her value as a slave and this on various frivolous pretexts but really and indeed not unavowedly in order to punish her for leaving his service in england though he himself had professed to give her that option these unquestionable facts speak volumes the case affords a most instructive illustration of the true spirit of the slave system and of the pretensions of the slaveholders to assert not merely their claims to a vested right in the labour of their bondsmen but to an indefeasible property in them as their absolute chattels it furnishes a striking practical comment on the assertions of the west indians that self-interest is a sufficient check to the indulgence of vindictive feelings in the master for here is a case where a man a respectable and benevolent man as his friends aver prefers losing entirely the full price of the slave for the mere satisfaction of preventing a poor black woman 
from returning home to her husband if the pleasure of thwarting the benevolent wishes of the anti-slavery society in behalf of the deserted negro be an additional motive with mr wood it will not much mend his wretched plea i may here add a few words respecting the earlier portion of mary prince's narrative the facts there stated must necessarily rest entirely since we have no collateral evidence upon their intrinsic claims to probability and upon the reliance the reader may feel disposed after perusing the foregoing pages to place on her veracity to my judgment the internal evidence of the truth of her narrative appears remarkably strong the circumstances are related in a tone of natural sincerity and are accompanied in almost every case with characteristic and minute details which must i conceive carry with them full conviction to every candid mind that this negro woman has actually seen felt and suffered all that she so impressively describes and that the picture she has given of west indian slavery is not less true than it is revolting but there may be some persons into whose hands this tract may fall so imperfectly acquainted with the real character of negro slavery as to be shocked into partial if not absolute incredulity by the acts of inhuman oppression and brutality related of captain i and his wife and of mr d the salt manufacturer of turks island here at least such persons may be disposed to think there surely must be some exaggeration the facts are too shocking to be credible the facts are indeed shocking but unhappily not the less credible on that account slavery is a curse to the oppressor scarcely less than to the oppressed its natural tendency is to brutalize both after a residence myself of six years in a slave colony i am inclined to doubt whether as regards its demoralizing influence the master is not even a greater object of compassion than his bondman let those who are disposed to doubt the atrocities related in this narrative on the testimony of a sufferer examine the details of many cases of similar barbarity that have lately come before the public on unquestionable evidence passing over the reports of the fiscal of berbice and the mauritius horrors recently unveiled let them consider the case of mr and mrs moss of the bahamas and their slave kate so justly denounced by the secretary for the colonies the cases of eleanor mead of henry williams and of the rev mr bridges and kitty hilton in jamaica these cases alone might suffice to demonstrate the inevitable tendency of slavery as it exists in our colonies to brutalize the master to a truly frightful degree a degree which would often cast into the shade even the atrocities related in the narrative of mary prince and which are sufficient to prove independently of all other evidence that there is nothing in the revolting character of the facts to affect their credibility but that on the contrary similar deeds are at this very time of frequent occurrence in almost every one of our slave colonies the system of coercive labour may vary in different places it may be more destructive to human life in the cane culture of mauritius and jamaica than in the predial and domestic bondage of bermuda or the bahamas but the spirit and character of slavery are everywhere the same and cannot fail to produce similar effects wherever slavery prevails there will inevitably be found cruelty and oppression individuals who have preserved humane and amiable and tolerant dispositions towards their black dependents may doubtless be found among slaveholders but even where a happy instance of this sort occurs such as mary's first mistress the kind-hearted mrs williams the favoured condition of the slave is still as precarious as it is rare it is every moment at the mercy of events and must always be held by a tenure so proverbially uncertain as that of human prosperity or human life such examples like a feeble and flickering streak of light in a gloomy picture only serve by contrast to exhibit the depth of the prevailing shades like other exceptions they only prove the general rule the unquestionable tendency of the system is to vitiate the best tempers and to harden the most feeling hearts 
never be kind nor speak kindly to a slave said an accomplished english lady in south africa to my wife i have now she added been for some time a slave owner and have found from vexatious experience in my own household that nothing but harshness and hauteur will do with slaves i might perhaps not inappropriately illustrate this point more fully by stating many cases which fell under my own personal observation or became known to me through authentic sources at the cape of good hope a colony where slavery assumes as it is averred a milder aspect than in any other dependency of the empire where it exists and i could show from the judicial records of that colony received by me within these few weeks cases scarcely inferior in barbarity to the worst of those to which i have just specially referred but to do so would lead me too far from the immediate purpose of this pamphlet and extend it to an inconvenient length i shall therefore content myself with quoting a single short passage from the excellent work of my friend dr walsh entitled notices of brazil a work which besides its other merits has vividly illustrated the true spirit of negro slavery as it displays itself not merely in that country but wherever it has been permitted to open its pandora's box of misery and crime let the reader ponder on the following just remarks and compare the facts stated by the author in illustration of them with the circumstances related at pages six and seven of mary's narrative if then we put out of the question the injury inflicted on others and merely consider the deterioration of feeling and principle with which it operates on ourselves ought it not to be a sufficient and indeed unanswerable argument against the permission of slavery the exemplary manner in which the paternal duties are performed at home may mark people as the most fond and affectionate parents but let them once go abroad and come within the contagion of slavery and it seems to alter the very nature of a man and the father has sold and still sells the mother and his children with as little compunction as he would a sow and her litter of pigs and he often disposes of them together this deterioration of feeling is conspicuous in many ways among the brazilians they are naturally a people of a humane and good-natured disposition and much indisposed to cruelty or severity of any kind indeed the manner in which many of them treat their slaves is a proof of this as it is really gentle and considerate but the natural tendency to cruelty and oppression in the human heart is continually evolved by the impunity and uncontrolled license in which they are exercised i never walked through the streets of rio that some house did not present to me the semblance of a bridewell where the moans and the cries of the sufferers and the sounds of whips and scourges within announced to me that corporal punishment was being inflicted whenever i remarked this to a friend i was always answered that the refractory nature of the slave rendered it necessary and no house could properly be conducted unless it was practised but this is certainly not the case and the chastisement is constantly applied in the very wantonness of barbarity and would not and dared not be inflicted on the humblest wretch in society if he was not a slave and so put out of the pale of pity immediately joining our house was one occupied by a mechanic from which the most dismal cries and moans constantly proceeded i entered the shop one day and found it was occupied by a saddler who had two negro boys working at his business he was a tawny cadaverous-looking man with a dark aspect and he had cut from his leather a scourge like a russian knout which he held in his hand and was in the act of exercising on one of the naked children in an inner room and this was the cause of the moans and cries we heard every day and almost all day long in the rear of our house was another occupied by some women of bad character who kept as usual several negro slaves i was awoke early one morning by dismal cries and looking out of the window i saw in the back yard of the house a black girl of about fourteen years old before her stood her mistress a white woman with a large stick in her hand she was undressed except her petticoat and chemise which had fallen down and left her shoulders and bosom bare her hair was streaming behind and every fierce and malevolent passion was depicted in her face 
she too like my hostess at govirno another striking illustration of the dehumanizing effects of slavery was the very representation of a fury she was striking the poor girl whom she had driven up into a corner where she was on her knees appealing for mercy she showed her none but continued to strike her on the head and thrust the stick into her face till she was herself exhausted and her poor victim covered with blood this scene was renewed every morning and the cries and moans of the poor suffering blacks announced that they were enduring the penalty of slavery in being the objects on which the irritable and malevolent passions of the whites are allowed to vent themselves with impunity nor could i help deeply deploring that state of society in which the vilest characters in the community are allowed an almost uncontrolled power of life and death over their innocent and far more estimable fellow-creatures notices of brazil volume two pages three hundred and fifty four to three hundred and fifty six in conclusion i may observe that the history of mary prince furnishes a corollary to lord stowell's decision in the case of the slave grace and that it is most valuable on this account whatever opinions may be held by some readers on the grave question of immediately abolishing colonial slavery nothing assuredly can be more repugnant to the feelings of englishmen than that the system should be permitted to extend its baneful influence to this country yet such is the case when the slave landed in england still only possesses that qualified degree of freedom that a change of domicile will determine it though born a british subject and resident within the shores of england he is cut off from his dearest natural rights by the sad alternative of regaining them at the expense of liberty and the certainty of severe treatment it is true that he has the option of returning but it is a cruel mockery to call it a voluntary choice when upon his return depend his means of subsistence and his reunion with all that makes life valuable here he has tasted the sweets of freedom to quote the words of the unfortunate mary prince but if he desires to restore himself to his family or to escape from suffering and destitution and the other evils of a climate uncongenial to his constitution and habits he must abandon the enjoyment of his late acquired liberty and again subject himself to the arbitrary power of a vindictive master the case of mary prince is by no means a singular one many of the same kind are daily occurring and even if the case were singular it would still loudly call for the interference of the legislature in instances of this kind no injury can possibly be done to the owner by confirming to the slave his resumption of his natural rights it is the master's spontaneous act to bring him to this country he knows when he brings him that he divests himself of his property and it is in fact a minor species of slave trading when he has thus enfranchised his slave to recapture that slave by the necessities of his condition or by working upon the better feelings of his heart abstractedly from all legal technicalities there is no real difference between thus compelling the return of the enfranchised negro and trepanning a free native of england by delusive hopes into perpetual slavery the most ingenious casuist could not point out any essential distinction between the two cases our boasted liberty is the dream of imagination and no longer the characteristic of our country if its bulwarks can thus be thrown down by colonial special pleading it would well become the character of the present government to introduce a bill into the legislature making perpetual that freedom which the slave has acquired by his passage here and thus to declare in the most ample sense of the words what indeed we had long fondly believed to be the fact though it now appears that we have been mistaken that no slave can exist within the shores of great britain narrative of louis asa asa a captured african the following interesting narrative is a convenient supplement to the history of mary prince it is given like hers as nearly as possible in the narrator's words with only so much correction as was necessary to connect the story and render it grammatical 
the concluding passage in inverted commas is entirely his own while mary's narrative shows the disgusting character of colonial slavery this little tale explains with equal force the horrors in which it originates it is necessary to explain that louis came to this country about five years ago in a french vessel called the pearl she had lost her reckoning and was driven by stress of weather into the port of st ives in cornwall louis and his four companions were brought to london upon a writ of habeas corpus at the instance of mr george stephen and after some trifling opposition on the part of the master of the vessel were discharged by lord winford two of his unfortunate fellow sufferers died of the measles at hampstead the other two returned to sierra leone but poor louis when offered the choice of going back to africa replied me no father no mother now me stay with you and here he has remained ever since conducting himself in a way to gain the good will and respect of all who know him he is remarkably intelligent understands our language perfectly and can read and write well the last sentences of the following narrative will seem almost too peculiar to be his own but it is not the first time that in conversation with mr george stephen he has made similar remarks on one occasion in particular he was heard saying to himself in the kitchen while sitting by the fire apparently in deep thought me think me think a fellow-servant inquired what he meant and he added me think what a good thing i came to england here i know what god is and read my bible in my country they have no god no bible how severe and just a reproof to the guilty wretches who visit his country only with fire and sword how deserved a censure upon the not less guilty men who dare to vindicate the state of slavery on the lying pretext that its victims are of an inferior nature and scarcely less deserving of reprobation are those who have it in their power to prevent these crimes but who remain inactive from indifference or are dissuaded from throwing the shield of british power over the victim of oppression by the sophistry and the clamour and the avarice of the oppressor it is the reproach and the sin of england may god avert from our country the ruin which this national guilt deserves we lament to add that the pearl which brought these negroes to our shore was restored to its owners at the instance of the french government instead of being condemned as a prize to lieutenant rye who on his own responsibility detained her with all her manacles and chains and other detestable proofs of her piratical occupation on board we trust it is not yet too late to demand investigation into the reasons for restoring her the negro boy's narrative my father's name was clashaquin mine is asa asa he lived in a country called bykla near edgy a large town edgy is as large as brighton it was some way from the sea i had five brothers and sisters we all lived together with my father and mother he kept a horse and was respectable but not one of the great men my uncle was one of the great men at edgy he could make men come and work for him his name was otu he had a great deal of land and cattle my father sometimes worked on his own land and used to make charcoal i was too little to work my eldest brother used to work on the land and we were all very happy a great many people whom we called adinyes set fire to edgy in the morning before daybreak there were some thousands of them they killed a great many and burnt all their houses they stayed two days and then carried away all the people whom they did not kill they came again every now and then for a month as long as they could find people to carry away they used to tie them by the feet except when they were taking them off and then they let them loose but if they offered to run away they would shoot them i lost a great many friends and relations at edgy about a dozen they sold all they carried away to be slaves i know this because i afterwards saw them as slaves on the other side of the sea they took away brothers and sisters and husbands and wives 
they did not care about this they were sold for cloth or gunpowder sometimes for salt or guns sometimes they got four or five guns for a man they were english guns made like my master's that i clean for his shooting the adiniers burnt a great many places besides edgy they burnt all the country wherever they found villages they used to shoot men women and children if they ran away they came to us about eleven o'clock one day and directly they came they set our house on fire all of us had run away we kept together and went into the woods and stopped there two days the adinyes then went away and we returned home and found everything burnt we tried to build a little shed and were beginning to get comfortable again we found several of our neighbours lying about wounded they had been shot i saw the bodies of four or five little children whom they had killed with blows on the head they had carried away their fathers and mothers but the children were too small for slaves so they killed them they had killed several others but these were all that i saw i saw them lying in the street like dead dogs in about a week after we got back the adinyes returned and burnt all the sheds and houses they had left standing we all ran away again we went to the woods as we had done before they followed us the next day we went farther into the woods and stayed there about four days and nights we were half starved we only got a few potatoes my uncle otu was with us at the end of this time the adinyes found us we ran away they called my uncle to go to them but he refused and they shot him immediately they killed him the rest of us ran on and they did not get at us till the next day i ran up a tree they followed me and brought me down they tied my feet i do not know if they found my father and mother and brothers and sisters they had run faster than me and were half a mile farther when i got up into the tree i have never seen them since there was a man who ran up into the tree with me i believe they shot him for i never saw him again they carried away about twenty besides me they carried us to the sea they did not beat us they only killed one man who was very ill and too weak to carry his load they made all of us carry chickens and meat for our food but this poor man could not carry his load and they ran him through the body with a sword he was a neighbour of ours when we got to the sea they sold all of us but not to the same person they sold us for money and i was sold six times over sometimes for money sometimes for cloth and sometimes for a gun i was about thirteen years old it was about half a year from the time i was taken before i saw the white people we were taken in a boat from place to place and sold at every place we stopped at in about six months we got to a ship in which we first saw white people they were french they bought us we found here a great many other slaves there were about eighty including women and children the frenchmen sent away all but five of us into another very large ship we five stayed on board till we got to england which was about five or six months the slaves we saw on board the ship were chained together by the legs below deck so close they could not move they were flogged very cruelly i saw one of them flogged till he died we could not tell what for they gave them enough to eat the place they were confined in below deck was so hot and nasty i could not bear to be in it a great many of the slaves were ill but they were not attended to they used to flog me very bad on board the ship the captain cut my head very bad one time i am very happy to be in england as far as i am very well but i have no friend belonging to me but god who will take care of me as he has done already i am very glad i have come to england to know who god is i should like much to see my friends again but i do not now wish to go back to them for if i go back to my own country i might be taken as a slave again i would rather stay here where i am free than go back to my country to be sold i shall stay in england as long as please god 
i shall live i wish the king of england could know all i have told you i wish it that he may see how cruelly we are used we had no king in our country or he would have stopped it i think the king of england might stop it and this is why i wish him to know it all i have heard say he is good and if he is he will stop it if he can i am well off myself for i am well taken care of and have good bed and good clothes but i wish my own people to be as comfortable louis asa asa london january thirty first eighteen hundred and thirty one End of section 9 And end of The History of Mary Prince by Mary Prince Thank you for listening.